So uh, in this lesson, we're going to implement a functional pattern where we're checking if something exists uh, in a list. So it's not, does this functional pattern exist? It's whether an element of a list exists. Um, so let's start with uh, the example. I'm going to copy paste and create uh, the example. So let me do code. And this is usually called member.bracket. Okay, need to add the um, record link. Okay. Now, of course, if I run this, it doesn't run because member is not defined. Do record member. Okay, it's saying. Oh, it's the other way around. Okay. So now it's complaining. Ah, because a member exists in the standard library of Racket, uh, so we want to define another one. I want to say define member. And this is the element, and this is the list. Okay. Uh, and for now, let's just return to do. Running it again. Okay, now everything fails and just returns to doing everything. So now we want to implement this function called member. Uh, and we have the tests where, if we look here, one is in the list. So that's why it returns true. Uh, true, the value true is in the list. So that's why the whole thing returns true. Uh, the number one is not in this list, although it's in this sub list. Uh, but this is a, a flat search, right? So it's ignoring, it doesn't know what the contents of the list are. So if they're lists, it doesn't look into them. Um, so in this case, there is no one. And finally, in the empty list, whatever value you try to find uh, is not there. So this is the empty list now. Okay, so now uh, let's try to implement the code. And as you will see, or as you probably know already, or possibly know already, when we're writing a, a code like this, where we have to go through the old, all the elements of the list, the function we need to implement a recursive function. Right, we want to implement a function that at any point of the list is processing one element of the list and usually is the first element of the list. Um, so we, we always have a condition. This is a very common pattern where we want to know whether something is in the base case or not. So in this case, as we make the list smaller, right, we are, uh, after all, trying to trying to uh, find an element in the list, what would be the base case? Well, the base case would be when the list is empty, right? So this would be the base case. So first thing we need to do is let's check if we're, we've reached the base case. Okay, so if the list is empty, what should we return? Well, if the list is empty, no member is there. So we know for sure that would be false. Otherwise, What should we do? Okay, so first thing we do is we get the head of the list, which is the first element of the list. And then we get the tail of the list, which is the rest of the list, right? We always make the, the list smaller and it's the fine, not the file. That is a weird word. Okay, so now what do we do? we want to check so this is what we have right the the tail of the list is we're going to use for the recursive step so we don't really care about it uh, the only thing we know is about the current element of the list which is h so is uh, the element in the list how do we know that well um <clears throat> there are multiple ways of writing this so one thing we could do is if this is a boolean expression Right, so the element, uh, you, you don't need to write a conditional to return the value, you can just write a Boolean expression, right? That's the result. Okay, so an element, uh, the, the LM value is in the list if um, LM equals the head of the, t of the thing or or if uh, LM is a member of the rest of the list, right? So this actually reads a bit better if we kind of spell it out. 
So let me spell it out. Okay, and we don't need this to do anymore. We close the parentheses. So let's do this again. We're defining um, a function member, right? If the list is empty, element is not there. Otherwise, we return a Boolean that contains what? It contains either the, when is it a member? That's how you have to think. Well, it's the element is a member if it's the first element or it's the, it's in the rest of the list, right? LM is the first element of LST or uh, LM is in the rest of the list. Okay, so if we try to run this, we see we forgot parentheses as usual. Okay. Now we run it. Ah, things work. Okay, so this works. Pretty good. So let's go back to the slides. Let's see what we got. Uh, this is how I implemented it. I actually implemented it in a, a conditional uh, rather than um, like so. And they're both correct. I and mean, those those are two versions of the same algorithm. Um, so let's let's look at this solution. What we have is three conditions that we're checking. If uh, x is um, if the list is empty, then false. So this is the same base case. Otherwise, what do we do? We check if x is uh, the first element of the list, and if that's the case, return true. Otherwise, check if x is in the rest of the list. So this is more of a like procedural way of thinking. Okay, whereas the version I showed here is more like logical, like a lot like a logician would think, I would say. So I guess I was feeling more logician today. Uh, is the recur is the solution tail recursive? Is the question now. So how do you do that? Well, we didn't cover too much about tail recursion when you have conditionals, but the basic idea is uh, a solution is tail recursive if all of your uh, branches are tail recursive. Um, if something is not recursive, that's tail recursive in a way because it means that it you can apply it, it's already optimized. So you have uh, here, there's no recursion. Here, there's no recursion. So the only place where you have recursion is in the else branch. And in the else branch, the recursive call, so the tail call, in the tail call position, you have member, which is a recursive call, and therefore this is tail recursive. Okay, I hope that was clear. Um, right, so, so now let's look more, let's take a step back and let's think about how, um, our code and a, a recursive algorithm actually mirrors the data that we're manipulating. And that's something very interesting, I feel, <laughs> at least. Uh, because what we're saying is that because the list has a certain shape, was constructed in a certain shape, right? You have the cons and you have the empty as the base case. That means that the code is also going to have these two branches always, or for the base case and for the cons case. Right? So you're going to have as many constructors as you have, sorry, as you have, um, sorry, you're going to have as many cases as you have constructors. So in this case, we have like in our solution, right? We have two cases, one for the constructor empty and one for the constructor cons. Okay. Um, so for instance, similarly with numbers, you would have one for the zero, which is probably your base case, and one for something with one added element, so the successor of that number. Or if you're decreasing, it would be the success, the, the pre predecessor, sorry. Okay, so a general recursion pattern for adding, handling lists would be as follows. You have this recursive algorithm where you have a V, which is your list, right? You might have more parameters, but what we're thinking about here is we're doing recursion on a certain list here called V. And you're going to have two cases, one for when the, one for the base case, when the list is empty, and another one for the constructor cons, 
And this is where you have the recursive step. Um, and to get the recursive step, you always call, you do something that handles the step, and then you perform uh, the decrement. So in our case, handling the step is this or, right? So you do something with V, right? We're doing something with V, here it is first. Uh, and then we're doing something with decrement, right? Um, so recursive call and the rest. So, and this is the general pattern. And as you can see, it's exactly what we have here. Okay, so we have the code and you have the recursive pattern. So I think it's a good exercise to try to look, try to implement a member yourself and then try to and then reflect uh, how does this pattern shows up in your code, right? And I mean, if you think about it, this is actually a general case for uh, recursion, where you're always recurring on some data structure, and you always have base cases where you handle the base case, and you have uh, steps that are for the recursive, for the things that are built on, the recursive data structure, and those will be the step uh, cases. So here's just a reflection on the, the, the running example. Okay, so next, uh, I have a few common examples where you, when you write recursive co code, that you would get errors. So first thing is, let's say you were writing this and you forget your base case, All right? So this could be a possibility and it's something that people do by mistake, they forget and they just uh, ignore the base case. So they ignore the fact that the list could be empty. So in that case, you will see this kind of error where it's saying it's gonna hit the first branch, right? Uh, which in this case is checking the first element of the list against X and because L could be empty, you get this contract uh, violation saying that list is not empty. So the way you read this is end, and then you see list question mark. So you're saying that the thing that is expected has to be a list and um, has to be not empty. Okay, that's how you read it. But you are given an empty list. It's very important that you guys learn how to write, how to read the errors because they are trying to help you. Okay, another common mistake is you forget to make the thing smaller when you recurse. So if you do that, like here, this is the original code, and if we get, how do we make the list smaller? Well, we call rest, right? If we, got, if we forget to call it, what would happen? Well, you would get, the list would never get smaller, so it would never get to the base case, and therefore your code would uh, loop forever. So the symptoms of this is if your program is looping forever, always check for the recursive calls, right? Check for your, the recursive calls and see if the value that you're uh, recursing on is getting smaller. It should be. If it's not, th there's your root cause. Okay, so the next thing I wanna show you is still in this video is how do we generalize member? So member actually is, is interesting because the example is um, a bit more than that. So let's try to look at another example. And the example wanna, I wanna show you guys now is, um, so consider this, this uh, function that comes in, in Racket that is bundled in the standard library. So let's call this example two. And the first call is checking, you're given a uh, string, so in this case, racket. And then what you're asking is, does racket start with R? Or uh, re rephrasing it, is R a prefix of this string? So this is already part of racket. So if I comment this out, this would work. Okay, so now I wanna do something similar, which is instead of if I have a list of strings, is there any string that starts with R? And we call this match prefix. Okay, 
So I'm going to try to define that. So I have the, here is the string x and here is the list. Okay, so what is my base case? My base case is if the list is empty. So if the list is empty, no, nothing, nothing starts with that prepick, so it can clearly return false, right? Otherwise, otherwise what do we do? Well, we can do, either um, string prefix uh, the, the prefix is x and this would be either the prefix is in the first element of the list otherwise x is a prefix of the rest of the list Okay, see if I forgot this. Complaining in line 29. So is R in the list? Yes. Oh, wait, I flipped the order. Okay. Yeah, string prefix actually takes the <laughs> the prefix on the right hand side, but my function takes it on the left hand side. I don't know why. Anyway, so this is how you code it, and as you can see, now compared to the member, it's almost the same code, right? See the or here. You see the two branches. You see equal, but now you have string equal, uh, but you have empty here as well. So could we look at these two functions and kind of generalize it? That's what we want to try to do. Okay, so how could we do that? So what is the only thing that is different here? Well, the only thing that is different here is, let's see, here we have x. So first thing, let's rename x to be lm. So this would be lm and this would be lm. Okay, so we have a function that takes two parameters, and here we have a function that takes two parameters. The only thing is that they're flipped. So if we kind of flip this around, member is the function itself, member is the function itself, and then you have lm in the first thing, lm in the first thing, and then rest of l, rest of l, so we can rename this to l so things start becoming a bit closer. See if things still work. Okay, so the only thing that really changed, right, is here we're calling equal and here we're calling string prefix, right? So if we want to generalize these two functions with one, a very easy way is, we've learned that in a previous lesson, is maybe we can use a function in the parameter. So let's call this p, let's call this exists. And what we do is p, we don't need the element anymore because we could just ask predicate and just do predicate. So I kind of went a step further and I even abstracted away the, the, the element because the, if it's a function, that function can hold the element itself. So if we don't change the element and if we, and because we're providing a, a function, that function can contain in its internal state, the element, right? So we kind of simplify things a bit further. Now let's see if this works. Okay. So how do we run this? Well, the way we run it is we call exists and when you pass a Lambda, right? Lambda that takes uh, the element that we want. We want to check if element, um, actually string prefix. Okay. And we want this to be the string and then R, right? Uh, this is the function that we want to pass and we want to call with this list. Now we check the same test. Check through. 
Now we run it and it works. Let me do X just so you guys believe me. Here it doesn't work. So if I write it to R, it does work. So what did I do? Well, I just passed a lambda, right? With the things that are different, right? So when you do match prefix, what you're doing is you're checking if X is a prefix. Starts with R, right? So now we could create a new match prefix, which is match prefix V2, right? Which what it does is it calls exists. It passes a Lambda that takes X. And then what does it do? String prefix. So what I'm writing is this prefix of X LM, right? Because the prefix is R and the prefix is given here. Uh, and finally, I'm going to do L. And now I can finally simplify all this. Call match prefix. See if the parentheses are right. Yay, and it works. Okay, whoops, this is the original version. Let's see if the second version works. Okay, second version works too. Um, okay, I hope this was clear. So what I did was I first, I looked at these two algorithms. I tried to find what was common between them. I realized that LM could be, since we could parameterize this function, become a gen, you know, just a function. But then I noticed that LM uh, can be stored in the function itself, so you don't need it. So essentially you just need one parameter for the first. And then I created a function called exist that checks if this predicate matches for any, at least one thing. And if it matches for one, then the whole thing returns true. And um, that's what I did. Here is the exist. I didn't put a question mark in the slides, but both correct. And here in the slides, I used the three conditions, which is fine. Um, okay, so in the next video, I'm going to write this um, another functional pattern called updating elements. Oops.